Okay. First of all, just let me say um, uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, so glad to be back um, at Bible study again. Um, I know it's been at least over a month since we've been at Bible study, and um, and I hope and pray that each one of you had an opportunity to do some reflection and have some prayer time and your personal study time. And I just pray that the sabbatical, which is always good every now and then in ministry, will help us to understand our need for God. And that's one of the reasons I decided to take a little time off. Uh, and hopefully uh, you didn't close your Bibles, but you kept your Bibles open. You went back and looked at some of the broadcasts that we've done in these last few months since the pandemic. And we pray that all is well. We pray that you had a wonderful day. Uh, we're broadcasting down here in uh, Houston, Texas, where I'm here visiting my wife. She's uh, Most of you know she's a surgical tech, so she didn't get to come home for Labor Day. So uh, I'm here in Houston. And as you can tell, I don't have my, my friend, my whiteboard behind me, but we will uh, be there next week. So again, grace and peace unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know I have people chiming on right now, Facebook Live, and I have some of my members on the teleconference. And we're going to go through a lesson series that um, my cousin, my cousin who's a covenant partner of Mount Calvary, uh, she suggested that we would do a series on the parables of Jesus or Jesus' parables. And um, I thought it was an interesting topic, and I'm excited about teaching it. I spent several weeks uh, reading my Bible and doing some background work on it. And I want to share it with you in these next few weeks. Now, um, it might be seven or eight weeks that we're going to do this series because it's very important that we understand, we understand what a parable is. And it's important that we understand the language and the uh, figurative speeches that are used in our Bible. And I hope and pray that those who are are watching on Facebook, if you just hit your share button and let's share this uh, teaching series with your friends and your families, and it's important that we share these messages in our teaching ministry at Mount Calvary. So those who are watching, go ahead and hit the share button. Uh, and so we can talk to you about parables. Um, and we also want to continue to pray for those who are going through. We know we still have things that uh, that's happening in our country and our society as it relates to natural disasters, um, the COVID-19. Uh, and we pray for all of those who are going through uh, those situations. We lift your names up in prayer. And plus the situations that's going on overseas. You know, our whole world is on the sick list. And we need to pray to God to, to help us to understand that he's still in control no matter what the situation uh, no matter what the circumstances may be, we serve a God who knows it all. So let's just keep in our, keep standing in our prayer closets and keep praying to the Lord. Okay, so let's go to our lesson tonight, and it's entitled, Introduction to Understanding Parables. Again, if you're writing this down, or if you don't have my syllabus, uh, please write down at the top of the page, uh, Introduction to Understanding Parables. And I thought it would be right to introduce this in a different way, in a different spin, because uh, as we begin to talk about parables, we need to understand uh, from a foundational point of view what uh, the figurative speeches in the Bible are. Uh, there are several uh, figuratives of speech in the Bible, and parables are just, are just one form, are just one form of the literary form of our Bible. And so I thought in this introduction presentation to you tonight that we would give you um, kind of a, a quick snapshot, a synopsis of what it means to uh, have figurative speeches coming from our Bible. And what does that mean? What does that look like? So I want you to stay with me. I want you to have your Bibles because I'm going to do a lot of teaching from the Bible tonight to help us to understand what parables are. Okay. And plus other various speeches 
and literary forms of writing in our scriptures. And then after we do this introduction tonight, for the next several weeks, we'll be specifically talking about uh, Jesus's parables. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to be alive. We thank you for your presence. And God, I ask that as we move forward in this teaching message, that you will bless each and every one of us. God, open our minds, open our hearts. And God, if you do that, we'll be so careful to give your name, the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So um, let us talk about parables, okay? But also let's talk about the other figurative languages in our Bibles to help us to understand a little bit of, more about what a parable is. The New, the New Testament word parable, okay? The New Testament word parable is not confined to just the gospels we know as Jesus' parables. Uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there are many, uh, there are various parables. Uh, out of all the ones I can pull from the Old Testament, uh, one parable that stands out to me, and I want you to write this down, comes from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 2 through 10. And uh, in your study time, maybe this week or whenever you begin to study and read your Bible, please open your Bible to that particular scripture. Here it is again for those who are writing it down. Ezekiel chapter 17, verses 2 through 10. There you will see a parable about two eagles and a vine. A parable about two eagles and a vine. And this parable, once you read this parable, what is lending itself to is the captivity of Judah by King Nebuchadnezzar. The two eagles and a vine. It's lending itself as a parable about the captivity of Judah by King Nebuchadnezzar. That's, now that's one of many, many Old Testament parables uh, in our Bible. But there are two prominent ideas about parables in the New Testament. Two ideas, okay, from the Greek. One idea is, uh, when you think about a parable, brothers and sisters, it means to represent or to stand for something. Parable, it means to represent or to stand for something. It means likeness. Or resemblance. It's a similitude or the placing of one thing, a one object beside another. These types of parables are used only. Listen, I'm gonna say only. You highlight that word only. These parables uh, that represent to stand for something or to place alongside something is only found, right? In the synoptic gospel, what are the synoptic gospel? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're only found in the synoptic gospels. In Matthew, you have 15. In the gospel of Mark, you have nine. In the gospel of St. Luke, you have over 35 parables that are used, okay? Parables meaning in this sense, we're hidden from the public. And we're going to talk about that as we discuss Jesus' parables. But these type of parables in the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke were hidden from the public and later revealed to those who were ready to receive them. They were hidden from those who had calluses, callous hearts. They were hidden from those who still had blinders on their eyes. But later, Jesus would reveal them uh, to his 12 disciples. And just to clarify that a little bit more in your hearing and those who have your Bibles, let's make sure we're on point when we make that statement. So those who have your Bibles that are listening and those who are watching, turn with us to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, 
verse, verses 11 through 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 11 through 13. Okay? And it reads at verse number 11, it says, he replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken away from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. Amen. So Jesus spoke to them in parables, the public, but in private, he would explain it to his disciples. And just to clarify that a little bit more, stay in Matthew chapter 13, and we're just going to read verse number 34. Matthew chapter 13, verse number 34. And it reads, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in what? In parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. He didn't say anything to them without using this literary form called a parable. Uh, it says in verse 35, if I can just read verse 35, it says, so was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. So Jesus spoke in parables. So that's one important idea about a parable. The second thing that's important about a parable is this. A parable can be looked as uh, what we would call dark sayings. D-A-R-K. Dark sayings. And you may say, well, Pastor... Um, what do you mean dark sayings? Did Jesus say any dark, mystical things that were wrong? No, that's not what that means. Dark sayings, and this is the second idea about a parable. Uh, it means sometimes Jesus spoke and it was difficult for the people or even his disciples to understand. That's what dark sayings mean. It doesn't mean wrong. It means difficult to understand. Y'all stay with me here because I'm going to give you some scripture on that. It means, some say it means wayside sayings, or it means a proverb. You highlight that word proverb because we're going to talk about that a little bit more. It means diverting from the usual means of speaking. And when Jesus began to speak to the people, he spoke in unusual, unorthodox ways. Not as the scribes, not as the teachers of the law, uh, not as the Pharisees, but when Jesus began to speak, uh, he began to speak in unusual ways and unusual means of speaking. And we're going to talk about that. These types of sayings are only employed in the gospel of John. When you talk about the difficult sayings or the dark sayings or those that divert from the usual means of speaking, you will find that employed in the gospel of St. John. So y'all highlight that. Not Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but in John. Parables in John are not really parables. Uh, they're close to parables. I mean, it's, it's hard to make a difference. I have a difference between a parable but they were and a proverb. They were more like proverbs than parables, okay? Uh, well, they were, actually, let me, let, me, let me change that. They were proverbs that sounded more like parables, okay? In the Gospel of John, they were actually proverbs. And what is a proverb? A proverb is stating a general truth. That's what a proverb is. And although they were proverbs, they sounded like parables. And we're going to go over some scriptures to prove that point. Or what we call an allegory. An allegory. An allegory is drawn from common objects. That's what an allegory is. It is drawn from a common object and incidents and available to use in the public. Available for public use. That's what an allegory was. 
So when you begin to read the gospel of John, dear brothers and sisters, don't try to search for the word parable, although it sounds like parable, but they're actually uh, proverbs, right? They're actually kind of like allegories, right? Where Jesus would use common objects or Jesus would, or John, the writer of John would use incidents available to use in the public. So when you begin to read the gospel of John, okay, John's gospel begins with that word I just stated. When you begin to read John's gospel, it's not a parable. When you begin to read it, it's an incident, right? It's an incident. It's what I would call a poetic hymn that tells the story of Jesus's origin, his mission, and his function. And before I read the, that particular scripture, let me say that one more time. John's gospel begins with a stating a general truth, a general truth about uh, Jesus's origin, his mission, and his function. Although uh, uh, we want to find it to be a proverb, I mean, excuse me, uh, a parable, no, it's kind of like a proverb or an allegory. Let's turn to John chapter number one. John chapter one. Those who got your Bible, I hear people turning already. John chapter one. You see, it states an incident. It's a poetic hymn, right? And it talks about Jesus. Uh, it talks about in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him, there was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the light was the light of all humankind. In other words, that is what we call stating a general truth about Jesus. All right. It sounds like a proverb or an allegory. Right. That's what it sounds like. Number two in the Gospel of John, I stated that word. I actually highlight that word proverb because you will find proverbial statements in the Gospel of John. It sounds just like the book of Proverbs, that that uh, uh, book that's right after the book of Psalms, Proverbs. OK, for an example. If you turn with me to John chapter 15, John chapter 15, and when you turn to John chapter 15, verse number 13, John chapter 15, verse number 13, brothers and sisters, and when you read that, it sounds like a proverb. As a matter of fact, it is a proverb. It says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Isn't that what it says? And then it says in 13, here's the proverb in, in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You see, that's more of a, a proverbial statement than a parable. And then you have what I called earlier those dark sayings. So write that down. Sometimes when you begin to read the gospel of John, you see these dark sayings, or as I forestated, sometimes Jesus would talk in statements that was difficult for even his disciples, those boys who walked with him. It was difficult for them to understand what he was saying, right? The dark sayings. Okay, so let's look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And let's begin at verse number 6. John chapter 15, verse number 6. I'm just going to read a, a few of those verses, then we're going to jump to uh, verse number 18. But it says here in verse 6 of John chapter 16, Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things to you. What did Jesus tell them? Jesus was saying, in essence, that he must leave them. 
Jesus says there in chapter 16 that he must go away. But when he goes away, he says that the advocate or the comforter will come. And Jesus says, when I go away, you can't go with me at this time. See, they didn't understand. It was difficult for the disciples to understand. Uh, it has a parable overtone, but it's still a proverb. It has a parable overtone, but it's still a proverb. Let's look at verse 18. Let, let me prove a point here. John chapter 16, verse 18. You see what it says? After Jesus tells them that their uh, grief would turn to joy, it says, look, well, let's jump up to John chapter 16, verse 17 to lead us into uh, verse number 18. It says at this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying in a little while you will see me no more that after a little while you will see me and because I am going to my father, to the father. They kept asking, what does he mean? See, that sounds like a parable whenever you don't understand anything. Like, what does he mean when he says our grief will turn to joy? Then they said, uh, we don't understand what he is saying. We don't understand what he is saying. That's a dark saying. They didn't understand. It was difficult for them to understand why their Lord Jesus, their friend, had to go away. There it is in verse number 18. You can read it again. But then if you jump down to verse number 25 of chapter 16 of John, verse 25, it explains it. Verse number 25, Jesus explains it. Though I have been speaking figuratively, look, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but would tell you plainly about my father. So he was using figurative language, but he says later on, I'll tell you plainly. Sounds like a parable, doesn't it? At first, you misunderstand it. At first, you can't grasp the meaning of what it says. Jesus says, I'm speaking to you like that. The disciples didn't understand. But he says, later, I'm going to explain it to you, right? So it sounds like a parable, but it's actually, if you read all of chapter 16, it's really not. It's what we call dark sayings or difficult, difficult to understand words uh, by Jesus, okay? So let me go back one more time for clarity. There were two prominent ideas about parables in the New Testament. One was to walk alongside something, or something represents another. And the second one are dark sayings, okay, are uh, borderline allegories and proverbs in the Gospel of John. No parables in John. The parables were only located in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So here's the question. The question is, what exactly, Pastor Gamma, so what exactly is a parable? If you had to just give us a general overtone of it, a general overview of it, what is a parable? A parable simply means bringing together, bringing together two different things so that one helped to explain and emphasize the other. Bringing together two different things so that one would help to explain and emphasize the other. A parable has been described as an outward symbol. And this is, this is going to lead us into Jesus' parable. It's an outward symbol of an inward reality. It's an outward symbol, something we can see, something we can examine something we can touch, something we can hold, something we can hear, is an outward symbol of an inward reality. A parable's power is in harmony which it brings out between the natural and the spiritual world. Let me say it again. A parable's power, there's power in a parable, is in harmony 
which it brings out between the natural world, the natural world that you and I are living in, right? The natural world that you and I are living in. And it's going to bring a connection to this world and the world that is to come and the spiritual world. So let, so let me say it like this. Let me say it like this. There are various, various phrases of figurative speeches or speeches in our Bible. There, there are a lot of them. When we read our Bible, we don't even realize the literary jewels that we have in front of us because there are a, a lot of different phrases of figurative speeches in the Bible. Sometimes we look at our Bible, we just kind of just roll through it, and we don't take the opportunity. That's why I say you have to study. Uh, the Bible says, uh, don't read to show yourself approved. You got to study to show yourself approved, right? So when you begin to study, you see all of these things that come up uh, uh, in our studying process, at least I did, uh, that helps me to understand and give me a clear assessment of what I'm reading, okay? So when I begin to look at the Bible, when you begin to start studying your word, remember there are several or there are various figures of speeches, and I'll, I'm going to only deal with a few of them tonight because I really want to get back to parables. And the reason I'm doing the various speeches, so when we begin to study Jesus' parables, you, you won't get them all confused, okay? You, it, I mean, it, it, it's going to come straight to you, okay? I promise you it will. So the first figure of speech in our Bible is what we call similitude. And that's spelled S-I-M-I-L-I-T-U-D-E. Similitude means something that is similar, okay? Something that is similar. Write that down. Something, when, you, when I read my Bible, in some of its literary form, it talks about things that are similar, okay? It means to resemble something. When something is similar, it means to resemble something. And when you begin to read our Bible, there are things that, that's written by the author that's similar. For an example, turn with me to... Uh, Psalm, the book of Psalm, number one, verses one through four. So just turn over from the New Testament to the Old Testament of Psalm. Psalms, Psalms one, verses one through four. And let's look at what it means when you read something that's similar in the Bible. I can just... You can highlight it. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of it without you reading. You can read it later on. But it talks about, he shall be like, L-I-K-A. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Isn't that what it says? Isn't that what it says? That in verse number three, that person is like a tree. That's similar. That means that person is like that tree. Where's that tree? Planted by the rivers of water. And if you read Psalms in entirety, that means that when you are blessed, or when we are blessed, the similitude or uh, the similarity is that we shall be like a tree. Okay, so when I begin to read my Bible, I know they, they use similar language. And then it says, the ungodly are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. So you see that two words, like? Like means similar. That means those who are blessed will, will be like a tree, and those who are ungodly will be like the chaff, that when you throw it up in the air, the wind drives it away. Okay, so that's, when you read your Bible, when you start see things like like, that means it's similar. The author is uh, making uh, a similarity between us and things that are visible to us and things that we know about. But then uh, after you read the literary form of uh, uh, things being similar, then the Bible talks about Proverbs, right? I know we have this wonderful book of Proverbs and our wisdom literature of our Bible. You know, we have Psalms, we have Proverbs, we have Ecclesiastes, we have the Song of Solomon. Those are what we call the wisdom literature of our Bible. But what is a proverb? 
A proverb is stating a general truth about something or someone. A proverb means to state a general truth about something or someone. And when you begin to read a proverb, you know, it, 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 it's a, a, a brief, it's usually a brief, less lofty, and not concerned with telling a story. So when you begin to read Proverbs, then you begin to read the Bible in its entirety, even in the New Testament. It's not concerned about telling a story. It just have these brief, lofty statements that states a truth about something or someone. It's, it's not telling is not concerned about telling a story. For an example, there it is in Proverbs 1 and 7. Y'all write that down. Proverbs 1 and 7. It says, now listen to the statement that it makes. It's not even a long statement. It just says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The end. <laughs> you know, so it's a brief, lofty, uh, a statement that's not telling a long narrative or a story. And although parables and proverbs are interchangeable in the New Testament, it's kind of hard to distinguish between the two. The so-called proverbs of John, and I just stated about John has proverbs, are much closer to a parable. And I, I forestated that. When you read the proverbs in John, they're more closer to a they're more closer to a parable than to a proverb, right? They're more closer. Not not. And I gave you one for an example. I gave you one from it for an example from John chapter sixteen, beginning at verse six. But then, if you look at if you look at John chapter ten, everybody turn with me to John chapter ten. John chapter ten. I can hear people turning already. John chapter 10, verse number 5. John chapter 10, verse number 5. Number 5 and 6. Okay. John chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. It says there, John chapter 10, verse 5 through 6. They will never fall as stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Then verse number 6. It says, Jesus used this figure of speech. The figure of speech. But the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. And that sounds like a parable, doesn't it? He used this figure of speech about the good shepherd and that this only the good shepherd's sheep knows his voice and another they will not follow. The, the, uh, the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. All right. They didn't understand. That's what it says. And then if you turn back to keep going back again to chapter 16, verse 25, but I'm not going to read that again, but chapter 16, verse 25 it said it spoke to them figure in, in a figure of speech, right? It spoke to them in a figure of speech. But then look at chapter 16 of John, verse number 29. And I told you, you got to have your Bibles out tonight. John chapter 16, verse number 29. Then Jesus' disciples says, Now you are speaking clearly and without figures of speech. You see, Jesus started to explain it to him, and they said, now we understand what you're talking about. So that sounds like a parable. Well, really, all it is is Proverbs and allegory, but it sounds more like um, it sounds more like a parable. This is now you are speaking clearly to us. So two of the various figures of speech are uh, something that's similar, and number two, Proverbs. Then you have three more, and then I'm going to let you go, and then we're going to really break it down with my little eraser board on next week. You have what we call in the Bible, some figure of speeches called metaphors, allegories, 
And of course, what we're going to talk about for these next few weeks, parables. So write those down. Metaphors, those who don't have the syllabus. Metaphors, you're going to have allegories, and you're going to have parables. All right. And really, brothers and sisters, it's really, uh, and I kind of learned this from being in high school and college, it's really kind of hard to distinguish between metaphors, allegories, and parables, but I'm going to do the best I can tonight from the scriptures so when we start talking about Jesus' parables, we can all kind of flow together. So what is a metaphor? A metaphor uh, affirms, listen closely, a metaphor affirms that one thing is another thing. Metaphors affirm that one thing is another thing. It means to carry over, right? It means to carry over. That one thing is another thing. Let me give you a, a metaphor that we probably use in everyday life. Uh, when you walk into somebody's classroom, kids going all crazy and stuff, you said this classroom was a zoo. See, it, the class, the, the kids weren't like animals, but it was a metaphor. This classroom was a zoo, right? Uh, sometimes we may say Dan or Jim or Jack is a chicken, right? It's not that they're actually a chicken. It's just a metaphor. That's something that we use in the world, right? That's a metaphor. But when you begin to read the Bible, a metaphor, or excuse me, metaphors are in the scripture. For instance, uh, just write this down or you can read it in your personal studies. Uh, Psalms 91, verse number two, is a good example of what a metaphor in the scripture means. Uh, Psalms 91, verse number two. It means to carry over. Listen. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. That's what it says. I'm sorry, that's that's um, Psalms 84 and 11. Uh, Psalms 84 and 11. It says, um, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. What does that mean? That simply means God, as a metaphor, that God is a protector. Right. So and God gives great light because when you talk about a sun, that's that's awesome light. And we talk about a shield, you talk about protecting oneself. And so the author of Psalms of this particular Psalms 84 and 11 says in his metaphoric language about God is that God is a sun and God is a shield. Now, we can all say amen to that, although it's metaphoric language. God is that to us. And we believe that. Number two, another piece of metaphoric language is found in Psalms 91 and 2. Psalms 91 and 2. It says, he is, who is? God is my what? Refuge and my fortress. That means God, that's a metaphoric language that God keeps us and God protects us. It's, it's, it's symbolic to mean God is a fortress that cannot ever be broken right, in our lives. So that's what God is. He is mine. That's a personal. My is personal. He is my refuge, right? And we can stop a little minute, a little minute, have a little worship, amen there, because God is my refuge and my fortress. And although it's metaphoric language, yet the author thought it was good to know who God is, right? Not God is like. That's similar. It didn't say God is like my refuge or God is like my fortune. He said God is. We sing that song in a metaphoric language. We didn't even know it. God is the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pains, misery, and strength. He promised to keep me. You know how the song goes. God is my all and all. That's metaphoric song language, right? Another piece of metaphoric language in the New Testament that was the Old Testament. So when you begin to read it, and it said, God is, he said, that's metaphoric. But it's a biblical reality of how great God is. For example, uh, in 1 Corinthians, y'all write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. It says, uh, Paul writes and he says, 
You are the body of Christ. Not you are like the body of Christ. That means it's similar. Now he says you are who we are. The body of Christ and individually members of it. Right? So that is a metaphor about us. About our relationship with God. The author thought it not robbery to use it in a metaphoric a metaphoric language by telling us who we are, right? We are a body uh, of Christ. So that's a metaphor. And then second to the last is an allegory. What is an allegory? And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that's listening and watching, it is not easy to distinguish in the Bible between an allegory and a parable. It takes some hard study and hard digging to kind of distinguish between the two. But if you give me a little license tonight, I'm going to try to do the best I can. An allegory, when you talk about an allegory, allegory has uh, multiple purposes. Okay, An allegory has multiple purposes. Our Bible has allegories. It has multiple purposes through symbols. right? So put that in there, that an allegory in the Bible has multiple purposes but they use those multiple purposes through symbols. And I'm going to give you some scriptures on that. So I just want you to write that down. And a parable is, is almost indistinguishable. But if I can try to do this tonight, a parable, and I'm leading us into next week, a parable illustrates one moral meaning. A parable only has one purpose. Unlike an allegory, an allegory can have multiple purposes, but an, uh, a parable has one uh, one purpose, and that's to illustrate a moral meaning. Okay, and we're gonna give you one of those tonight before we let you go. An allegory is the teaching of one thing by another thing. It's the teaching of one thing by another thing. Additionally, brothers and sisters, parables and metaphors serve to open and explain some hidden truth that cannot be easily understood. Let me say that one more time. An allegory, right, which has multiple purpose through symbols, and parables, which only has one particular purpose, and it illustrates it through a, 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 a moral meaning, something that's moral. Listen, state, but both serve to open and explain some hidden truth that cannot be easily understood. The allegory implies that one thing is another. So y'all write that down, that the allegory says to you and I that this one thing is another and we got to show it to you through a symbol. Right. We got to show it to you, to you, to me through a symbol. Right. For an example, Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse number one, y'all write that down. You turn to it later in your studying process, but you write that down. So an allegory says, let me give you a symbol. OK, the symbol is Jesus says, I am the true vine. Because Israel were agricultural people. They were farmers. And so Jesus gives an allegory of who he is and who his father is and who we are. He says, I am the vine and my father is what? The husbandman or the gardener. Okay. This depends on what, which translation you read it. Right. So in other words, Jesus gives them an allegory through a symbol. Let me give you another one. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You know, bread was very important to the people of Israel during this time. Unleavened bread. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life. That's John chapter 6, verse 35. Right? So he uses an allegorical symbol to show who he is, not only to God, but to us. Another one he said, another one uh, allegory that he uses in scripture uh, in John, John chapter 8, verse 12 through 20. Jesus says, and you're going to be familiar with this one, I am 
the light of the world. Right? I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the vine and my, my father is the husbandman. And I think it's seven I am's in John where he uses allegorical symbols, right? right? And see, it serves multiple purposes because a vine is not like light. Light is not like bread. He says, I'm the good shepherd. You know, he goes on. So it serves multiple purposes, right? And it uses, his, uses uh, symbols. That's different than a parable. Here's the last one, and then we're going to let you go, and you're gonna get, we're going to get ready for my little writing board on next week. I'm excited about it. So here it is. Parables. Right? Parables. Uh, my cousin Barbara wanted me to teach on parables, so here it is. Uh, parables means it's an image. An image is borrowed from the visible world, the world that we see, the world that we know the world that we're familiar with. It's an image borrowed from this visible world and is accompanied by truth from the invisible or the spiritual world. In other words, it's connecting what we can see, what we can feel, what we're familiar with to a world that we've never seen, a world that we have never inhabited yet, right? but we know that it's there, it's coming. So that's what a parable is. Uh, parables are barriers, I mean carriers are, are barriers, uh, the channels of spiritual truth for two reasons, right? I said to you earlier that a parable gives uh, a different uh, than a, um, uh, an allegory because a parable gives more of a moral meaning, one moral meaning, right? One moral meaning. That use symbols. It illustrates a story. That's what a parable does, unlike an allegory. Who give symbols, a parable illustrates a story that has moral meaning, right? And it, and it, uh, it, the channels of spiritual truth is given for two reasons. It, number one is given conviction and a divine authority. So whenever Jesus gave a parable, it convicted the heart of those he revealed to, the truth to, and it gave divine authority. To his disciples. Number two, parables. They are rules and therefore ought to rule. They are rules and ought to rule. R U L E, right? So I have to give you one before I I wanted to save this one because this is one of my favorite ones. Because here it is again. A parable, unlike an allegory, uh, gives a moral meaning illustrated through a story. So Jesus gives a story because if I begin to read and you turn with me to Luke chapter 10, this is the last chapter for tonight, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I have here verses 25 through 37. Verses 25 through 37. There was, um, Jesus was talking to a, um, an expert in the law one day, right? He was talking to an expert in the law. And the expert in the law wanted to know who was his neighbor, right? I don't know if he said it to try to be smart. I don't know if he said it to try to entrap Jesus. I don't know why he said it. Uh, but he says there uh, to Jesus, he asked Jesus, if you begin to read at verse number 25 on down to verse number 30, uh, it, uh, it says there in verse number 29, I guess it answered that question. It says in verse number 29 of chapter 10 of Luke, it says, but he wanted to justify himself, right? He wanted to look good. He didn't want to be embarrassed. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor, right? Who is my neighbor? So Jesus begins to tell a story, a parable to illustrate one major point. That story is about generosity. I'll write that down. That story is about generosity because the man, this expert in the law, wanted to know 
well, who is my neighbor? When Jesus said, you got to love your neighbor, you know, uh, he said, well, who is my neighbor? So if you begin to read uh, Luke chapter uh, 10 and verse 30, he talked about a man that was going down to Jericho, right? And when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him and passed by on the other side. But, see, see, Jesus is getting to illustrate a something that's visual, visual, but it has heavenly meaning that God expects, right? But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor? Those who are watching, those who are listening. Which of the three do you think was a neighbor to this man who fell into the hands of robbers? Well, the expert is going to answer that question for us tonight. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So you see how that parable differs than an allegory, right? It doesn't use symbols like I am the vine and, and um, like uh, I am the bread of life or I am the light of the world. No symbols, just telling a story that has moral significance from the visual world to the about the invisible world of what God expects from us. And every now and then, Jesus had to go and pull them to the side and explain it to them. Amen. For next week, we will open our teaching and conversation about Jesus' parables. Until next Wednesday, please read and study and write down some parables of Jesus. Choose one parable that really pricks your spiritual intellect, right? And you can type it into me, email it to me, however you want to get it to me, drop it in the drop box at Mount Calvary, however you want to get it to me, uh, because there are a lot of parables that we can talk about. And I know we can't talk about all of them. And maybe it might be one that you might not really understand. You've been studying it, you've been reading it, you've been praying about it, but you might not understand it. We want to talk about uh, the parables of Jesus, okay, on next week. Uh, most of you um, got this right here on the email. So I think that is, that's what uh, Barbara Massey sent to me. And I sent it to all those who are on my email contact list. Uh, a lot of pages there. Uh, but I want you, if you have enough paper in your, in your uh, printer, to print this out because it really has some good stuff. And those who don't have it, if you want it, just call the church office and let me know. And we'll try to get some to you. But it's called the New, New Testament Parable of Jesus. Okay? And we're going to be coming straight from this right here. And if you don't have it, if you just have your Bibles and you see parables in your Bible, uh, choose one. And please email me. Uh, Brother Turner, you can put that on there. It's Galman1. G-A-L-M-O-N and the number one, Galman1 at AOL.com. Okay, or you can just type it into this little uh, text box here and let me know that you you want a copy um, and we'll try to email it to you and get that to you as quick as we can. Amen. Uh, look forward to talking to you next week. Uh, I hope I didn't confuse too many people tonight when it came to talking about the different figures of speeches in our Bible, but I thought it was important for you to know so when you started reading things, you won't get confused and thinking one thing is a parable and it's not, or one thing is a, a proverb and it's not. Uh, and um, hopefully I clarified that a little bit tonight, and it takes a lot of hard work to do it, but 
we want to really talk about and just you know focus on parables on next week. Again, may God continue to bless you. May have a smile on you. Can't wait to see you when we get back. Uh, we're praying for all of you. Pray for one another. And uh, we look forward to seeing and talking to you soon. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for allowing us to share this message tonight with these, your people. And Father, I pray whatever was said tonight will open our minds and open our hearts to a better understanding of our relationship with you and our relationship with our brothers and our sisters. And Father, we ask that you would bless all of Mount Calvary, all of our members, those who are sick and shut in, those who are going through physical pain. Father, we ask that you would touch their feeble bodies. God, raise them up from their bed of affliction. God, let them see the glory of the Lord in their life, in their minds, and in their hearts, that you can do everything, God, even, even heal their bodies. God, there are a lot of people that are going through some spiritual traumas in their life. God, don't know which way to go. And Father, we pray for an anointing over their lives, God, that they make the right decisions in their life. Because, God, you are watching us, God, and you are taking inventory of everything we do and we say. And for all of our covenant partners that chime in with Mount Calvary, week after week, Sunday after Sunday, and Wednesday after Wednesday, we pray for them and their families, God. Keep them in your, in your care. And when it's all said and done, Bless me and my family who feels the least of them all. We give it all over to you, Lord. It's in your hands now. Whatever we said and whatever we did today, let it be pleasing in thy sight. For it is in Jesus' awesome and matchless name we offer this your servant's prayer. And the people of God said amen. 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 Go in peace. Uh, pray for safe travels for my wife and I. We headed back tomorrow. God bless you. We'll see you soon.